Now, this video is a presentation which is part of a cryptography course at Chalmers University, Sweden. And the intention is to give a simple introduction to Shamir's secret sharing scheme and to secure multi-part uh, computation, which is based on that sharing scheme. Now, the purpose of this scheme is to divide one secret value over a number of people in such a way that each person does not learn anything about the secret value. Only if a certain threshold number of people group their shares together, they can retrieve the secret. And this scheme can then be extended to perform computations on the shares of the secret. And by only grouping the results of these computations, we can learn the outcome of a computation without revealing the secret inputs. Most introductions to this topic go straight into the mathematics and the Grange interpolation, which frankly may look like a monster. In this presentation, we'll transform that monster into your friend. And we'll introduce you to an extra friend, which you can use as a substitute for the Grange interpolation. But let's start simple. Here we have some empty graph paper. We can plot functions on this graph. For example, the linear function f of x is x. Or slightly more interesting, f of x is 8 minus 2 times x. Although these straight lines may seem straightforward, they have one property which we find interesting for our secret sharing scheme. Let's take an arbitrary point here, 5,4. The question, how many straight lines go through this point? Well, the answer to that question is, of course, that there is an infinite number of lines. Now, for these lines, what can be the value at 0 for f of 0. Again, the answer is that this can be any value depending on what line we drew through that point. Now we added another point here, 4,5. Now we ask the question how many straight lines go through these two points? Here there can only be one straight line, this one. And it's also not hard to see that this line is described by the function f of x is 9 minus x. Now for these lines, which there's only one line, that go through these two points, um, what can be the value of f0? f0? There can only be one value of f0, which is 9. So, summarizing what we have seen so far, two points determine one straight line, and if we know only one point of a straight line, f0 can be anything, but if we know two or more points of a straight line, there can be only one value of f0. So this gives us the following idea. Say Alice wants to split the secret, 6, between two other persons, Bob and Carl. She can do that by choosing a secret straight line, f, such that f of 0 is 6, and she then gives Bob and Carl each one other point on that line. So graphically, Alice wants to secretly share the value 6. She chooses a function that only she will know, and here it is 6 minus a half times x. And now note that this function has the value 6 when x is 0. She then selects two different points on that line and gives them to Bob and to Carl. Here, Bob knows that f of 4 is 4 and Carl knows that f of 8 is 2. And we call these two points the shares of the secret. Now, since Bob only has one point, there is an infinite number of possible lines that go through this point. And therefore, there's also an infinite number of possible values for f0, the secret. And similarly for Carl, on his own, any value of the secret is possible. Only when Bob and Carl combine their shares of the secret function, they can reconstruct the function, since there is only one line that passes through both points. Therefore, together they can find the value of the secret at f0. And note that if Alice distributes more shares of the secret, for example, she gives another point to Dave, any two of these shares are sufficient to retrieve the secret value, because any two points determine the secret line that Alice has used to share the secret. So following up on our summary, uh, two points determine one unique straight line. If we use a straight line to share a secret over any number of participants or shares, uh, more than one or at least two, the shares need to be combined in order to retrieve the secret. Okay, let's go back to our visual story, but now we are going to use slightly more complicated functions, quadratic lines. If we are given two arbitrary points of a quadratic line and the question what line goes through these two points, then like we saw before for the linear lines, 
there is an infinite number of quadratic lines that go through these points. And for any value, we can find the line that goes through that value at F0, as well as through the other two points. However, when we are given three points, they determine one unique quadratic line. Therefore, given three points, they also determine one unique value for F0. So, similar to what we had for straight lines, for a quadratic line, we need at least three points to determine the line and its value at F0, otherwise any value for F0 is possible. So, of course, we can try to use a quadratic line uh, to split Alice's secret instead. Remember that her secret value was 6, and now Alice chooses this particular secret polynomial, and in, again, choosing it such that f of 0 is 6, her secret value. And as before, she distributes different points on this line, the shares, to a number of people. Since this is a quadratic line, we need at least three points to determine the line and to retrieve the secret. So any three of the shares need to be combined in order to learn that f of 0 is 6. Again, following our summary, we, if we use a quadratic line to share a secret, more than two shares are needed to retrieve that secret. Now we can see a pattern emerging here. If we use a polynomial of degree 1 to split the secret, we need more than one share to retrieve it. If we use a polynomial of degree 2 to split the secret, we need more than two shares to retrieve the secret. So the question then is, does this pattern really continue? If we have a polynomial of degree 3, do we need more than 3 shares to retrieve it, etc. And it turns out that yes, there is a pattern. So if we take 4 arbitrary points, then they determine a polynomial, one unique polynomial, of degree 3. And it's, it's this one here. If we take 5 points, they determine a polynomial of degree 4. And if we take 10 points, they determine a polynomial of degree 9. Now, clearly, this last polynomial is a little bit unreadable, but the important point here is that it's just a polynomial of degree 9, and that there is only one, and only this one, that visits, visits all these 10 points. So, generalizing our summary, Alice can spit her secret by choosing a secret polynomial of degree L, such that for x, this polynomial evaluates, uh, when x is 0, this polynomial evaluates to her secret value. And she then computes the shares of a secret as all the points of that polynomial. Now, the only question that remains is how to retrieve the polynomial once we have combined the shares. So how do we compute this crazy function from those 10 points? It turns out that this is where we, our monster uh, the Lagrange interpolation is needed. And we'll look at this now, but introduce it in a bit more friendly way than jumping it uh, straight into it. So, say we have received four shares of a polynomial of degree 3. This means that we can determine the unique polynomial that visits these four points. So how do we construct this function? How do we reconstruct the function um, such that it visits all these four points. Now it's good to observe that we do not really care right now about how this function evaluates for any of the other points. So for when x is 3 or 10 or even when it's 0, when it gives us the value of the secret. We only wanted to visit these four points. And since we know that there's only one function of degree 3 that visits all these four points, then for that polynomial, the value of f0 must be the value of the secret that was shared using this polynomial. Now to reconstruct this function, the first idea is to create a small function for each point that you want to visit. We call these functions delta and they behave as follows. For uh, f5 is 3, the first point, we create a function delta 5 that evaluates to 3 if x is 5, and to zero otherwise. Similarly, for f of 7 is 2, we create a function delta 7 that evaluates to 2 if x is 7, and to zero otherwise. Now we do the same for all these other points. And then we define our final function f as the sum of these four delta functions. 
Now you can see that this function f indeed behaves as we want for the four points that we are interested in. If we plug in for x a value of 7, for example, then f of x becomes 0 plus 2 plus 0 plus 2, which is 2. So f of 7 is 2, which is what we wanted. And this works also for the other three points. Now these delta functions all look very similar. So let's try to make them more similar. So instead of return 3 or 0 for delta 5, we're now going to make it return 1 or 0. And in our final function f, we multiply the result of delta 5 by 3. So that in the end, we still get the same result. We either get 3 times 1, which is 3, or 3 times 0, which is 0. So it's still the same behavior, except delta 5 looks a bit different now. And we can do this for all the other delta functions as well. So now they really start to look even more similar. So we can abstract them, right? They all have the form that delta i of x is 1 if i is equal to x and otherwise 0. So let's write it like that. Okay, but the function, however, is not a polynomial yet. First, let's recall that we did not care about the other points. So we do not have to specify how this function behaves for the other points. For example, delta 5 of x only needs to be 0 when x is 7, 12, or 30, but for any other value of x, we don't care how this function behaves. So let's write a function like that. So we define c to be the set of all points we are interested in, so 5, 7, 12, and 30, and we define delta i to return 1 if x is in c and equal to i, to return 0 if x is in c and not equal to i, and otherwise we do not care about what this function returns because it's not one of the points we're interested in. Now we're going to try and write this polynomial. So as a first attempt, we define delta 5 as a product of x minus the other point in c. So delta 5 is x minus 7 times x minus 13 times x minus 30. And similar for delta 7 and for the other deltas. So the good thing about this function is that it evaluates to 0 for all values in c that are different from i. For example, for uh, delta 5, it evaluates to 0 when x is 12 because it becomes something times 0 times something, which is 0. Unfortunately, it does not yet evaluate to 1 when x is equal to i, right? Delta 5 does not yet evaluate to 1 when x is 5. So instead, we modify the polynomial just a bit and divide each value by 5 minus that other value in the set C. So we get that delta 5 is x minus 7 divided by 5 minus 7 times x minus 12 divided by 5 minus 12, etc. So this formula still evaluates to 0 for all values in C that are not equal to 5, right? Because for one of these fractions, we get 0 divided by something which is zero, and therefore the whole formula evaluates to zero. And at the same time, if x is equal to five, then we get the computation five minus seven divided by five minus seven, which is one, times five minus 12 divided by five minus 12, which is one, times five minus 30 divided by five minus 30, which again is one. So we get one times one times one, which is one, and that's exactly what we wanted. Now we do this for all the delta functions, and again, we would like to write this slightly more abstract. So for each delta i function, we take the product of x minus the other values in c, divided by i minus the other values in c. We can write this abstractly as follows. Delta i of x is the product of x minus j, divided by i minus j, for all values j in c that are unequal to i. And now observe that what we have here is a polynomial of degree 3, right? Which is exactly what we were after. So going back to the general formula we are reconstructing now, this looks as follows. And since we are simply adding three polynomials of degree 3, the function f itself is also still a polynomial of degree 3. 
Therefore, this means we have found the only polynomial of the grid tree that visits these four points. And therefore, the value at F0 must be the secret. So, in other words, we did it. Now we can continue to write this even more general. And uh, note how we multiply delta 5 of x by 3, where 3 is f of 5, and we multiply delta 7 of x by 2, where 2 is f of 7. So we, we can replace these numbers by f of 5, 7, 12, and 30. And then, once you have done that, we can write that more generally as the sum of f of i times delta i of x for all i in c. And if you, have, if you have seen Lagrange interpolation somewhere before, you will now see it is exactly the same as the normal introduction to Lagrange interpolation. Now, in most cryptography courses and textbooks, though, uh, you will find that we are talking about functions and polynomials over finite fields rather than normal numbers. If that's the case, don't worry, this story also applies to finite fields. You just should not forget that instead of uh, division, you have to multiply with the modular inverse of the value in this case, i minus j. So as this was originally an exercise session, you can now do a little exercise if you want to. Uh, we do assume that you are familiar with the concepts of final fields, uh, finite fields. Alice has shared the secrets using a polynomial of degree two, and she used the finite field z11. And we have obtained the shares that f of three is two, f of four is one, and f of five is two. Now, since these are three points on a polynomial of degree 2, this means they determine the unique polynomial that Alice used to share the secret value. So you should be able to use Lagrange interpolation to reconstruct the polynomial and retrieve the secret. So good luck! In the next video, we will see the solution to this question and look at a simple version of secure multiparty computation building on the sharing scheme. Oh, and we introduce this new friend that you can use as an alternative to the Grange interpolation. See you then.